welcome. This is Majesty Sussex Report, and I'm Antonia. <sighs> Let me be honest with you. I've been struggling the last few days, and my struggle was not about Trump winning, but it was more about how I was and what I was going to say to you. I wanted to, as always, I tried to be honest, forthcoming. So I took some time to really think about it. And as I predicted, the pundits were out at full force, yelling and blaming this or that, but mostly pointing fingers at minority groups. Every minority got their, you know, their blame to take. They were blaming decisions that Kamala made, the ones that she didn't make. They were blaming Joe Biden, the Democratic Party. And as I was putting a new episode together, I found myself falling into the same. It was what I was getting from social media. It was what I was getting from traditional media. So I finished the episode, I watched it, and I thought, something doesn't feel right about it. You know, I spoke a little bit about the election, consequences of it. Then I had, you know, some content about the royals. Didn't feel right. All of it just seemed so fake. It seemed so put together to please people, to just regurgitate what I had seen and heard and listened. I don't know how much of it was really me. So I said, you made a promise to yourself. You wouldn't be putting things here or saying things that you didn't believe in or that weren't you. So I scrapped it. I had then started over again. And this time around, I, th I thought I would bring in more social media stuff. What was, what was the people really saying? And, and, and take it from that angle. But I found that even though valid, I was adding on to the anger within minority groups. I might get some violations and I may offend some people with what I'm going to say. And I don't. To all you Latinos that voted for Trump, I hope he mass deports you and your entire family. Whether you were here legally or not, you got to go. I hope he does that. To you black men who your fragile ego couldn't take a black woman in office, so you either voted for Trump or you didn't vote at all. The police will now have carte blanche to murder you, right? And when they do that, there's not gonna be no GoFundMe's. Don't ask your family to ask us. They can't afford to bury you, dig a hole in their backyard, it is. But don't expect sympathy. Don't expect protest in the streets. We're not doing that. Black women, we're done. With, we're, we're, we're done. We did our due diligence for this century and the next. We've done enough. We're not doing. We're not doing anymore. To you, white women, that once again voted against you. When your husband start knocking you into the middle of this week and you can't do anything about it because no fault divorce is in play, I want you to take those black eyes and those busted lips as a personal thank you from Donald J. Trump each and every time. Don't look for nobody else. Don't ask for f Take your beatings. For all of y'all that voted for Trump, I hope you get exactly what you voted for. Because so angry, right? I'm so angry. We lost everything. I don't even think a lot of y'all even realize we lost everything. I don't want to hear words of wisdom and, you know, God got it. I don't hear none of that today. Today is a day of grief and I'm taking it. You know, and God do got it. But God gives us everything that we need to succeed. We took everything that he has given us and we gave it away. God got it. It's all in God's hands. Yes, it is in God's hands. 
He showed us exactly who we were dealing with. And we said, you know what? I ain't going to go with your word. I'm going to go with this man's word. That's what we did. You can ask God for a million dollars. Pray and pray and pray for a million dollars. And God will give you everything that you need to get to that million dollars. He'll give you your talents to use. But if you don't use those talents and you send your ass on the couch, how do you think you're about to get a million dollars? A lot of y'all be expecting God to come right down to your face and take your arms and move you like a puppet. That don't mean God is doing his job. God is doing his job by giving you what you need to succeed. God showed us exactly who that man was. He let us listen to him. I heard him. I seen him. All the while, y'all making memes and videos and things like that. You know, uh, dance party. Follow me here. So, you know when you're a kid and you're getting bullied for the first time and you look around and you're like, does anyone want to say anything? And everyone's like, mm, I ain't got shit to do with me. I'm I'm cool with the bully. Me and the bu uh, bu And you're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to have to sell suit. I'm going to have to keep pushing. No, no choice but to keep it moving. And after that, years go by and you try and empathize with the bully. You try, you know, oh, maybe they grew up in a bad home. You, you try and be like, hey, bully, me and you, we're like, we're similar. Like, don't you see? And then you're an adult and the book bully is bigger and badder than ever because now they can affect your livelihood, your rights, the way that you move through the world. And you look around again and you think, oh, maybe this time, maybe those closest to me will see what the bully's doing and they'll stand up from they'll stand. No, they turn a blind eye or they stand behind the bully. It's never not traumatizing. And I know a lot of people are like, well, that's victim mentality. And to that, I say that. People that have endured and people that are survivors are every that live in everything but a victim mentality because they have to move forward. And a lot of them use their voices to make sure that they don't make anyone else the victim on their way. So take what you will from that. But I know a lot of you bitches with no backbone standing behind the bully these days gloating have to live with that. And we don't. You see, as you know, I'm a multiracial person. I've navigated different cultures for, for my entire existence. And it almost felt as if I was fighting with myself. And I've done a lot of that throughout my life. Because society, religion, everything I know has always told me that I am nothing. Has always blamed me for each and everything or told me I deserved it. For decades, we have blamed women and we continue to do it. When R happens or SA happens, when they're assaulted, what do we do? But what were you wearing? Why did you walk down that street? You probably provoked it. When black men are pulled over and they end up unalived, we hear over and over and over all the things that that man, that black man did in his life. All the horrible things that he did. We blame him. And we say, if he had just listened to the officer, that would have not happened to him. And then what happened? We started to see black men obeying orders, doing as they're told, and they still end up on a line. They still end up on a line. At work, we're told that we didn't get that promotion because you talk too much. You're too opinionated. It's your fault, right? <laughs> I was told that I, I, I had, well, I wasn't told this, but I realized that I had too many opinions. I had too many ideas. And for some reason, I was over overshadowing the, the the person who should be the one having the opinions. I was being invited to speak at, at, at the conference or two or, 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 or to lead panel discussion. And he said it to my face. He said, you should not be leading those panel discussions. It should be me. I'm superior to you. The next time you get an invitation, you send it over to me. I authorize whether or not you are allowed to go speak. Okay, you're a white man, and the panel discussion is about intersectionality of minorities. 
Are you a minority? No, you're not. Should I be forwarding that also to you? His answer was yes. He will choose who he thinks is good enough because I am not good enough. We have self gurus today that tells us that, you know, stop blaming other people for your issues and your things. You should take the blame. Shut up, take the blame, it's your fault. Let me see, yeah, it was my fault. Walking home from, 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 from having some drinks with some friends, walking down the street, being called names and taunted and so on. And I continue walking, ignore them. Not the first time. Next thing I know, I felt a fist at the side of my face. Fell to the road, off the pavement. And the next thing I, I felt was the blows to my head, to my face, to my stomach, to my spot, to my entire body. The only thing I knew to do was to protect my face and my head the best I could. And I just started calling out for God. So that was my fault. I should have somehow maybe responded back or, 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 or said something. You see, there's an entire system that is constructed for us to blame each other, for us to blame ourselves. It's our responsibility. Oh, I should have not walked down that street. I mean, it was, it was two blocks away from my home. I managed to get home, managed to pull myself onto my bed, thinking maybe I should call the cops. And I kept saying to myself, and then what will happen? What will happen? You're in pain, you're bloody, and you're gonna call the cops and have to go through an entire system. And what will happen? I knew what would happen, nothing. I woke up the next morning with a face I didn't recognize. And my pillowcase, my pillows, my sheets, I had to wrap it up, take it off, put it into a garbage bag and throw it all away. Needless to say, I had to buy a new mattress also. So I kept feeling just horrible because I had redone the episode like three times and each time I just not, I, I just didn't feel right about it. There was this heavy cloud over me just to say, you said you would never put out something that you didn't believe in. You said that this is part of you. You said these things, Antonio. Do you believe in what you're saying right now? And as I watched the first time I did it, I was like, nah, that's not me, that's not me. Did it again, did a, a different angle. I said, no, that's not me. That does feel wrong, feels wrong. Did it again, and I kept going, oh, why am I having such difficulty with this? And I said, you know what? This is a channel about royalty and, and, and Harry and Meghan, just concentrate on that. Let's talk about South Africa. Let's talk about the UN. Just talk about that, forget the rest. <sighs> and I thought, okay, I'll do that. And I started, I finished it, and it made me so sad. So sad, because I thought, what a cop out. You live in this society, you're part of this society, what is happening outside of this will affect the people who listen to you, who watch you, it will affect the world. So what are you doing? If you have 2000 people on, on this platform, maybe just a hundred of them listen to you. But this is what you're going to serve to them? So I, I, I just kept being at lost and this conflict just kept getting bigger and, and, and me feeling very unable. And then I just sat yesterday and I prayed. And I said, God, I'm so lost right now. And I don't know what to do. 
I just don't know what to do. Then I just need some guidance. I don't know. Tell me something. <laughs> or maybe take away take away this feeling that I've got. And just let me just do something. Let me just put out something. Be ashamed that it could happen in the Netherlands uh, in 2024. Hours earlier, Maccabi Tel Aviv fans gathered in the center of the city to celebrate their team. It is still unclear exactly how the incidents unfolded. But videos circulating on social media show some Israeli fans damaging Palestinian flags hours before the match. And in these pictures, a crowd of Israeli fans chant anti-Arab slogans as they march toward the stadium. At the same time, pro-Palestinian demonstrators also tried to reach the stadium. Their march had been banned days earlier to prevent confrontations, but a large number still turned up. Among the many videos posted online, this one shows a Maccabi fan struggling to get out of a canal as a group of men appear to force him to chant pro-Palestinian slogans. Say free Palestine and we go! Good! Several people have been hospitalized and more than 60 people from both sides have been arrested. It was a good game. I thought in the beginning uh, Israel was better, but now Mali is getting uh, is destroying them. I think Israel is not bad. Israel is not bad, but I think I think Mali is going to destroy them today. No, I'm just talking about football. I'm just talking. I'm just talking about football. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Violence in Amsterdam left at least five people injured and dozens have been arrested. But what happened? Supporters of Israeli football club Maccabi Tel Aviv arrived in Amsterdam ahead of their UEFA Europa League match against Amsterdam club Ajax. On Wednesday, social media videos verified by Sky News show Maccabi Tel Aviv fans tearing down Palestinian flags from outside of homes. Other social media videos appear to show residents chasing Maccabi oh. Tel Aviv fans. Come on, come on. on Thursday, just before the game, crowds of Maccabi fans were filmed singing racist and anti-Arab songs. While a pro-Palestinian demonstration had been banned by the mayor over fears there would be clashes. Later that evening during the match, Israeli supporters appeared to disrupt the minute silence for Valencia flood victims with chants, whistles and fireworks. Maccabi fans were seen attacking locals as a police car can be seen driving by. People with Palestinian flags were seen marching on the streets. Maccabi supporters say they were beaten and attacked on the streets of the Dutch capital with videos showing some of the violence. Say free Palestine and we go! Good. Sky News could not independently verify all of the footage shown. Police arrested 62 people. Five were taken to hospital, but have since been discharged. Israeli far-right ultras are notorious for their racism and physical violence. Dutch, Israeli and British leaders denounced the attacks as anti-Semitic and even referred to it as a pogrom but their statements failed to mention the assaults by the Israeli hooligans against Dutch citizens.
In the 2024 election, Donald Trump's closing message was chaotic and at times outright surreal. A blend of strange promises, of color humor, and unexpected policy shifts. But here we are, facing another four years, we hope, with him at the helm. The contrast between Trump's approach and Kamala Harris's campaign could not have been more stark. Harris's message focused on unity, hope, and collaboration, enlisting a roster of stars to energize voters. With performances by well-known artists, she seemed to be courting every last vote with warmth and optimism. But that message of unity ultimately fell flat. In a sea of Trump's fierce anger, inflammatory rhetoric, and crowd-pleasing outrage. I was often amused, surprised at the things he said and did, and the audience just clapped in jubilee, insinuating certain acts with a microphone, and oh, God, jolly, the women for conservatism and the sanctity of television and the messages that, that are being fed to our children and the outrage from the women and, and parents who showed up at school boards to talk about books said nothing because it was okay. It's Trump. On the campaign trail, Trump pulled no punches. Luncheon in insults at every one from political opponents to the media and stirring up his base with anger rather than hope. His rhetoric and actions reflect a style that has always been uniquely Trump. Everyone wonders how come he gets away with it? He gets away with it. His supporters aren't here for policy consistency or for a rational governing plan. Do you remember when they were all saying the entire media was saying, Kamala Harris doesn't have a plan. Kamala Harris needs to explain what her policies are. And she did. She did. Continuously. In details. But still today, you'll hear them say, she had no plan. <laughs> You see, the supporters of Trump and those who voted for him, they're here for the spectacle, for the bravado, for a leader who feeds off their anger and their frustrations. Even with his offbeat declarations, Trump found a way to connect with a core that values dominance and sees his aggressive style as authentic. Think about that. When he said he would give officers of the law immunity to do as they wish. Mm. When he says that a wife needs to obey her husband, no matter what. Mm when he boasts about his conquests and things he would do or not do, when he talked about who he would fire and who he wouldn't, the insults about weak this and weak that, oh, they all got so excited. An orgy of nonsense, of bravado, and a desire of wet dreams to be dominant again. Everything that women have fought for, everything that minorities have fought for, scrap it all. Because that's, that's the danger. That's what is ruining our society. So, as the dust settles on this 2024 election, here we are again. <laughs> left to grapple with a national reality that feels surreal. Trump, a twice impeached convicted felon 
has become the first criminal to hold the highest office in the land. The outcome is astonishing. So much so that it demands more than surface level analysis. Who really voted for him? And moreover, more importantly, who is shouldering the blame for his victory? It's tempting, isn't it, to dissect every minority group, every demographic deviation, the political pundits, bunch of idiots. They're all getting paid, they're all on cable news and whatever TV channel you decide to watch and listen to all day long, spinning their wheels on why Kamala Harris lost. You see, I'm not so interested in why she lost. I'm interested in how did he win? Now the pundits go on and they, well, did she lean too far to the left? No, 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 no. She didn't lean far enough, says another. Was her stance on foreign policy issues that upset it some? Oh, she should have come out and make a declaration. But here is what the numbers show us. Here is the reality of things. While minorities have often been expected to bear the blunt of electoral responsibility, this outcome wasn't on them. And as a matter of fact, most of it is not on them. The reality is stark. Among white voters, which no pundit is talking about, none, at least the ones I've watched and seen thus far, among white voters, 67%, that's men and women, 67%, so the majority Majority, okay? 67% chose Trump. Yeah. White men and women, the majority of America's electorate, voted overwhelmingly in favor of Trump. The numbers reveal an uncomfortable truth. This is less about a failure of the Democrats or a lack of turnout for minority communities. So let's stop the blame game for a minute. Or let's just stop it, period. It's not the, the black dudes that voted for Trump. It's not the Latino men that voted for Trump. Because if all of them, if all of them had voted for Kamala Harris, he would have still won. He would have still one. This is about a long-standing trend where election after election, the majority of white voters choose conservatism. They choose Trump. Do you think when Obama got elected it's because white people came over to vote for him? No, 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 no. It wasn't white people. Do you think when Joe Biden won? No. The majority of white people still voted the other way. And yet, we don't see endless analysis and finger pointing towards the white electorate. Why is that? You see, it's easier to examine why black men didn't vote in higher numbers or why Latino men moved a few points towards Trump. I mean, I was a victim of it. I was the victim of that narrative. But even if every single minority group had shown up at unprecedented rates, it wouldn't have shifted the outcome enough to overcome the majority vote. And that is facts. It's facts. So I don't care 
what analysis people come up with oh blame it on this person that person the other person blame it on bernie blame it on kamala blame it on the old folks the young folks blame it on trans people blame it on homosexual blame it on gay blame it on whomever you want to blame it on you're probably blaming the wrong person or the wrong group so why do we keep looking everywhere but where the numbers really point this analysis of who to blame becomes a distorted lens that once again places the weight of democracy on the backs of minorities because you see now we're going to destroy each other let me say one thing well i've said a lot already but it's black women who consistently show up so leave black women alone leave them alone leave them alone they voted 85 percent for harris it's black women who carry the hopes of change oh, damn it it's black women who carry the hopes of change in every election the most marginalized group and yet they too are often left questioning why? Why they should bear the burden of fixing what others repeatedly choose. This election, like so many others, holds up a mirror to America, to the United States of America. Trump's victory doesn't only reflect who he is as a candidate. It reflects who America is, or at least 67%, a significant portion of America is. You see, all this talk about fascism, authoritarianism, and threats to democracy, there's something in Trump's appeal that resonates deeply with a larger part of the electorate. And until we, they address that directly without deflecting blame onto minority voters, we wouldn't truly understand the problem. I mean, we may see it as a problem, 67% don't, they don't, because they don't. you see, they're emboldened now, even more so. Messages are going out to, 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 to black folks, men, women, adult, old, young, children. You need to report to go work on a plantation. You're now a slave. Emboldened. You see, I don't forget when people were being spat on the streets. When young girls and boys who were black were being called names at their schools and the teachers, oh, well, you know, that's little Johnny. Johnny's just, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it didn't just happen in the USA of America. It was happening in good old Britain. Right now we have in Britain people celebrating this. We have the leader of the Tory party, who is a black woman celebrating the election of Trump. Hmm. As much as pundits and analysts want to explain away this outcome, to dissect every policy, position Kamala Harris took, the truth remains the majority chose Trump. The majority endorsed his rhetoric, his record, and his behavior. And until we're willing to acknowledge that, we'll keep spinning our wheels, analyzing everything but the real issue. White people are not giving up power. They're not. I've said this before. 
they're not. In the end, this isn't a story about minority voters, about whether they did enough or did or didn't. This is a story about America's choice, a choice that goes beyond policies and parties, revealing a deep division and values that shape United States of America. And perhaps it's time we all take a hard look in that mirror because the image reflected is as much about us as it is about Trump. Leaving your hometown is tough and it will psychologically challenge you the same way leaving conservative ideology is tough and will psychologically challenge you. I've always said being a Republican really appeals to the two most primal, fundamental, and survival-based parts of humanity, which are reaction and comfortability. It's hard to ask yourself the tough questions of why do I actually feel this way about black and brown people or Jewish people or if trans people exist, what does that mean for my understanding of sexuality or gender or how I fit into the world around me? And you don't have to do that. If you have found community in Republicans, you can just react in response to your initial uncomfortability. We'll just build a wall, keep the Mexican out of the country and my problems will be solved keep trans people out of classrooms racism and homophobia are intellectually lazy traits yes but they pair really nicely with our most primal instincts of fear of the unknown but the truth is the type of advanced thinking that created the advanced societies that we live in today required us to develop mental capacities that look past those primal urges and make creative solutions to complicated issues using uncomfortable variables trump won your vote because he convinced you that he was a businessman and he knows how to run a business but we just learned from this case that he ran a crooked business that got bankrupt six times. Now, is it more believable that the entire United States court system is just out to get him? Um, or is it more believable that he's just a shitty business owner? But it's uncomfortable to believe that you got deceived, right? It's easy to believe that everyone's just out to get me. And if you're a Republican voter, you can just believe the easy thing and go along. There's actually a reason why people from your home...